what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a little bit of an odyssey here. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, some of this gets a little depressing for a few minutes. I'm not the most depressing guy you've ever met, I'm telling you right now. But, but I think it's important to ground us in what's going on um, and to, to just understand that, in, fa in point of fact, um, we do have a blank screen. And we do have uh, a, uh, a serious challenge. Um, and it starts with food. And uh, you know, you hear this line, you see this line, but this is honestly, truly what's going on. If you just start for a moment, and I think everybody in this room knows this, uh, if you just look at the obesity epidemic in this country, I'm gonna take you through a series of slides. So Stonyfield started in 1983. Um, seven cows over here in Wilton, a little west of here. Uh, you know, an organic yogurt company in 1983 was a little, you know, out there. Nobody was eating yogurt. No one knew what organic was. We, the, the way I described the business back then is that we had a wonderful company, just no supply and no demand. <laughs> but, but, um, but, you know, we've persisted and become a pretty large player in the food business. Um, and so what I'm going to take you through is an odyssey that begins of our, that our, what our nation has been through in the 28 years since 1983 by looking at the uh, percentage of uh, states uh, in uh, who have, where we are, citizens are obese. And note as the years go by, so you move into the 90s, note the scale along the bottom here as I take you through this. Uh, you'll note the first in the 83 when we started, it was nobody was more than 14%. Now notice as we get into the 21st century, no state is, there we go, no state is under 20. Um, the 2011 data I just saw uh, earlier this afternoon, um, and you can just imagine it's just more of the same. Two-thirds of us now are obese or overweight. The percentage who are obese exceed the percentage are, who are overweight. I'm sure I don't have to explain to this audience the link, that there's a clear link between obesity, fat cells, and cancer. Those are indeed the only two kinds of cells that grow as adults, uh, fat cells or cancer cells. Um, but this is, a, this is a national tragedy. And of course, we're also exporting this all over the world. A fifth grader, I was born in Manchester. Um, a fifth grader uh, in my childhood weighed 13 pounds less than a fifth grader does today. 18% less, or I should say differently. Eight, kids are now 18% heavier. That, this is only like a 55 or 60 pound kid, right? We're talking about, you'll notice the girls, because of social influence, are a little behind. But it's still, these are, these are terrifying numbers. And as you, if you forget about the ethical and moral aspect of this, just look at the financial aspect. And you realize this is, I mean, we, we are paying for this. This is, this, is, this is just overweight. You add obesity uh, into the picture. And this is what we're talking about. This is $200 billion a year that is utterly and absolutely preventable, putting it differently, that other countries don't pay. Uh, and it's a, it's, it, this, is, this is just uh, you know, ridiculous. And the sister of, of obesity, of course, is diabetes. This is a horrifying statistic out of the CDC. By the way, that number is one in two if you're African American or Hispanic. And again, this is you know, absolutely, utterly preventable. And again, if you look at the correlation by, with obesity and diabetes, of course, it's the same. And again, I draw your attention to the dollars here. This is uh, uh, you know, 175 $174 billion a year problem. So then when you take the statistic of the president's cancer panel, and by the way, the cancer panel, if you're not familiar, was actually formed by Ronald Reagan in 1983. And the first year that the cancer panel reported out to the president uh, in 83, um, the, this esteemed oncologic panel, top oncologists in the country, um, calculated that it was likely that 21% of Americans would have cancer. That was 83. In one generation, we've gone to 41. So where's it headed? It's obviously a trend line. And by the way, that number, if you want to put it in dollars, is in the trillions. So when we talk about preventative care, again, everybody in this room, everyone in our lives has been touched by cancer. I've lost five friends to pancreatic cancer in the last four years. My wife's a breast cancer survivor. Everybody here knows this, um, know, know, knows the situation. This is not, of course, the way it was through most of our lives. Um, Again, I promise you, I'm not going to stay this depressing for long, but, but bear with me. Um, my world, of course, is the world of trying to eliminate inadvertent exposure to toxins. And by the way, the President's Cancer Panel, when, it, when the Bush-appointed panel reported in to President Obama 
in July of 2010, they, the, they said that the number one cause of this trend of 41% is inadvertent exposure to toxins in our lives. Not just food, air, water, soil, food, and of course even our kitchen, look under your kitchen sink and look at our carpets and our fabrics and so on, but primarily food. And this was very bold and of course uh, exactly what, uh, when you say follow the money, exactly what industry, uh, which is now spending $41 million right now, I'm flying to L.A. Uh, at 5 tomorrow morning. I'm, I'm on the Bill Maher show tomorrow night if you want to watch. Um, um, and I'll be talking about this. They're, 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 they're $41 million is being spent to stop something called Proposition 37, which is an effort to label genetically engineered foods. I chair a national coalition to get the FDA to label genetically engineered foods. It's not because we, we, we can, anyone can say genetically engineered foods are hazardous to your health or not, but what we can absolutely say is that the herbicide tolerant gene that they have engineered into these crops has led to the overuse, to the use of 527 million more pounds of herbicides tied to the introduction of these crops, which by the way we shouldn't be surprised about because these patented crops are owned by chemical companies. And well, I'm sure Bill Maher is going to have a field day with this. Um, so I focus a lot on, follow, you say follow the money, and indeed, uh, I, I'd say the corollary of that is follow the chemicals. This is a study, I probably don't have to say a word about this now, you've seen what I'm talking about. In 100% of, nearly 100% of pregnant women, 43 uh, toxins, here's the list, were found um, in 99% of pregnant women, 15 to 44. This is a demographically... Uh, uh, geographically, economically diverse sample, uh, and this study was just uh, conducted uh, uh, and reported earlier uh, uh, last year. Uh, many of these chemicals, by the way, in the, uh, were banned long before these women were born. We all have DDT in our tissue, even though it was banned here 60 years ago, because it's incredibly persistent. And of course, it's also used in other parts of the world. Um, this one is really depressing, <laughs> um, sorry, but um, in looking in 2004, this landmark study done by the Environmental Working Group lo uh, looked for, uh, uh, for uh, 400 chemicals in the cord blood at the moment of birth of infants, found 287, half of which are known carcinogens. Now, let's, I want to be very fair and, 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 and objective about this. That's not saying they were at carcinogenic levels, you know, this is... One of the challenges of our modern, a lot of people say to me, Gary, organic's a really nice idea. It's not really proven. And I would submit it's actually the chemicals that are not proven, that we've been on a 70-year experiment with our bodies and the planet. And you know, if you stop and think about it, all of humanity ate only organic food right before World War II. You know, George Washington ate only organic food. He did fine, right? Jesus Christ ate only organic food, right? I mean, Mozart, uh, you know, I mean, uh, but but if this the, our generations now, and of course our children, who are who are uh, who are the guinea pigs in this grand experiment. And the problem is, we only know about five percent of the, on the agrochemicals. We only know about the health effects on rats of about five percent of those chemicals. But we have no idea of the cumulative effects, none. And we have zero idea of the synergistic impacts. The National Academy of Sciences is now introducing, as we speak right now, new methodologies to begin to measure synergistic inputs. That is what happens when you're exposed to multiple compounds. But the problem is, in the course of a year, you, we're exposed to 100,000 different chemicals. So the combinations are literally in the billions. And you know, this is essentially what we call pre-pollution of infants when you have these kinds of data. And of course, we know that children we, we, by the way, we've no, 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 all the testing that's done is done at adult levels. We have zero idea because we don't test on children. Uh, but we know that at the time of maximum cell reproduction, which is childhood, this is where uh, the impacts are, are even more grave. And I'll come back to that data in a second. Now, I mentioned the President's Cancer Panel. Um, the very same month uh, that the panel reported out to the President that we really need to stop uh, messing with, we really need to, the pre president really needs to use his power to, to start to reduce the amount of chemicals, not just slow down, but actually reduce that we're using. Uh, a, a study came out in pediatrics unequivocally linking uh, exposure pre-age uh, pre 7 um, it, uh, to pesticides to ADHD. I'm on the board of a camp, John knows the camp, uh, you went there too, uh, uh, here in New Hampshire, where um, 
the nurse who's been there 30 years tells me that when mom, the moms and da dads come in and drop, you know, little, you know, Gary, little John off, they then get in a line at the infirmary to drop off the drugs for ADHD. This is not something that she's ever seen before. It's an epidemic. And it turns out now there's, a, there's an absolute published in the most, one of the most prestigious children's health, public health uh, journals, is that there's a, uh, you know, there's a direct correlation. By the way, we've seen the correlation with IQ, de brain development now, just published this summer, blood-brain barrier disruption, where how we get the food to turn into electrical energy to operate our whole, this ecosystem that we walk around with, uh, really upset, uh, upset. Now, if you are wondering, if you want to have an idea of you know, what's going on here, and you, if you had a non-organic banana for breakfast this morning, just close your eyes for just a second, because th <laughs> this is what's used, and you can titrate and find in the, in the tissue of a non-organic banana. And, and, and this idea that you can wash this stuff off, I trust I don't have to educate you all about this. That's long since debunked. This, these compounds are in the water, which means they're osmotically transferred into the cell. So inside the apple, inside the banana, inside the peach, inside the strawberry. And again, it's a pretty depressing uh, list of stuff that's out there. Now, we all know that we're having um, uh, some, uh, because of the research and the dollars, there, there is some attenuation of the the curve uh, here, but it's, it's much more due to preventative than, than treatment. Um, and, but nevertheless, you know, over time, this is the kind of curve we're looking at. And people say, well, you know, that's because that's we're, we're living longer, right? It's, you know, adults are living longer. But when you look at childhood cancers, you see, you know, sadly, the same, uh, same kind of trends. What's interesting is that the trends are also really correlated to um, uh, societies to where we live and, and to Western lifestyles. Uh, we are truly exporting a different kind of technology uh, here than we think. We're exporting, uh, you know, this this uh, this uh, uh, chemical technology uh, and and li and the, the kind of lifestyle that has clearly resulted in in these kinds of exposures. And there are studies that um, Lorenzo Cohen, the fellow at MD Anderson, is mentioning, will show you where he looks at uh, Chinese Americans. Uh, 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 same age, same demographic, same actual cities of origin in China, and he can, he compares side by side, and then Chinese American women, um, same uh, demographic, obviously, have nowhere near the cancer rates. But by the way, China's catching up fast, as you will find from from women still living there. We are there's something going on with our lifestyle, um, and. Actually, there's the study right there, and and so this is comparing San Francisco to Shanghai, and you can see the different age groups, U.S. Uh, to actual China. So, uh, what is it? What's going on? Well, it turns out that it's probably a little too simple to just talk about chemicals, uh, like anything else. We are ecosystems, and uh, we are treating our bodies, no surprise, exactly the way we're treating this bigger ecosystem called planet Earth. We no one will say these words, but we act and behave and, 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 and function as if the earth was a subsidiary of us, that it's there for the dumping and it's there for the taking. And, and of course, the exact opposite is true, right? All economies have been made possible by a bountiful earth that's nurtured us, but we, we kind of have it all wrong. We have these myths that how we built modern society, these myths of, of waste, we're the only species that produces a toxic byproduct from our economic, from our activities that kills other species, kills ourselves. Uh, we have the myth of a way that where we, where we send our waste. I have not figured out where that is yet. I'm 58. I'm not sure I'm ever going to. Um, we have the myth of externalities. This idea that if you, a national cancer epidemic, a diabetes epidemic, an obesity epidemic, global warming, disruption of family farmers, a depletion of fossil waters, these, these, these direct results of our economic activity, because we don't put a price on them. We don't, as a business person, I'm never held accountable for my contribution to any of those. It's not on my P&L. Therefore, in economic terms, Wall Street terms, they don't exist these externalities. That's a deep mythology that we've got going, that we've allowed ourselves this get out of jail, you know, free card. And it turns out the way we grow our beef and our chicken and our poultry, for example, in these feedlots, and if you've seen Food Inc., you've had a taste of this, uh, may well have something to do with all of this. In other words, this, this is about synergistic impacts. This is not just about one thing we're doing. It's a lot of things we're doing. Western lifestyle encompasses a, a whole lot of ground. One of the aspects is a lot of things one could say about these feedlots, and again, at the risk of, 
you know, making you utterly depressed. I always like giving these talks on the ground floor so when people try to throw themselves out the window, it's not as hazardous. And I'm going to be done with this soon. Hang in there. But one of the things about these um, feedlots, you know, there's no, n there's nothing natural going on in this feedlot. They're eating corn. They're not carnivores. They're herbivores, right? They should be eating grass. But, and one of the things that happens when you're not eating grass and you're not eating, um, uh, you're not getting natural vitamins, is the omega threes in your in your beef dis literally disappears by the time of harvest. Now, why am I talking about omega threes? Well, this is Daddy Gary now saying, if you're not taking your fish oil, please do nothing. If you do nothing else, go off and do it. Why? Because it turns out omega threes are anti-inflammatories, and it, and it turns out omega sixes soy, corn, oil, and uh, canola, and so forth, are, are pro-inflammatory. That is, you grow, you can actually create inflammatory conditions when you get yourself out of whack. We're supposed to be, as a species, around three to one correlation between sixes and threes. We need both. You need both for a healthy balance. But all, all, most of us are walking around at about 20 to one. If you go to McDonald's three times in a week, you can go to 45 to one. So, and why is that? Because of this, because there's literally, this is dominant, there's no omega-3s. Well, what this means, when you think back to that fifth grader, is that the butter, pork, beef, and eggs from 1960 that looks the same as what it is today is not, in terms of nutritional content, but in terms of just omega-6 to 3 ratios. This is what it was then, this is what it is now. So, uh, so the second thing you need to do when you walk out of here is start eating organic. And that may sound self-serving, it is, but guess what? Um, you know, this is the only way grass-fed access to pasture, it's the only way you can be certain that you're getting full nutrition. I, when I say certain, I mean legislatively certain. I mean, there's a law that requires access to pasture. That's called the organic regulations. So this may be a factor. Um, this leads me to the last depressing area before I talk about what we can do about this. So thank you for hanging in and not running out the door. But I, I mentioned I'm chair of this coalition. Um, in 1990, well, in 1992, uh, under uh, Vice President Dan Quayle, you'll remember he didn't spell so well, uh, he ran something called the Council on Competitiveness. And uh, in tandem with the money, uh, to the point of the introduction, uh, in advance, as these genetically engineered crops were f making their way through the regulatory pipeline, scheduled for approval in 95, 96, they um, required that the FDA limit its uh, definition of what is material to be labeled to organoleptic and nutrition, meaning can you taste it, see it, smell it, or is it nutritionally different? In other words, any other consideration did not merit being labeled. This was diabolical and brilliant because in 96, when the first GE crops came along, and you can see most of them are here, um, you could not even though in Europe, when GE crops were approved, that labeling was required, you actually could not label them here. I mean, you, you could voluntarily label that you have them, but uh, you know, I have yet in 30 years to meet the consumer who wants the yogurt with synthetic growth hormone, okay? Maybe you're here tonight, but I haven't met you yet. Um, and this is the interesting thing. Uh, of course, the patent holders of these crops are Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, uh, Monsanto, uh, Bayer, et cetera, and they're here. And what they don't now consider to be material is the fact, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that because the primary gene that has been introduced into these crops is for herbicide resistance so that farmers can use unlimited amounts of herbicides because the crops themselves no longer get affected by them, we've now seen an increase, and this is a study that was reported, this is a peer-reviewed study re last Monday, that from 86 to 2011, the number is 527 million pounds more herbicides being used. This is 2,4-D uh, glyphosate, which is Roundup. And again, um, these are the compounds owned by the same companies who own the seeds. So this is a very brilliant uh, development. The only problem is, and this is data through 2007 that shows you with the three biggies, Genetically, now soy, 90% of soy that's out there is genetically engineered, 78% of corn, and, um, and uh, uh, also uh, about 80% of cotton. And what's happened is that but if the overuse of herbicides, we've now created a new species of weeds. The weeds getting 
blasted with these poisons do not wait around to do focus groups. They just evolve. And they've evolved to becoming herbicide resistant. There, there are 22 weeds now on 17 million acres across this country and 26 states that now cannot be controlled by herbicides. They're called super weeds. I'm, on the, I'm a co-chair of a national uh, organic, uh, agricultural policy board funded by Gates and Ford and you know, some of the really big foundations. And I, we, we had meetings in, in Sacramento last week where farmers were telling us from Arkansas that these weeds are now growing eight feet tall, the diameter of my wrist, and they can stop a combine in their tracks. Okay, these are truly, wow. you know, mega weeds. And the problem is that um, the only way you can actually control them is with uh, manual physical uh, harvesting. There's the super weed map. It's, it's now grown since uh, that. You can literally only control by going out there and actually chopping, which no farmer can afford. And so what they have suggested uh, uh, in their inimitable wisdom is that the way to control these weeds is to use more powerful herbicides. So now Dow has brought out 2,4-D. Now 2,4-D, those of us with gray hair know that 2,4-D is 50% of Agent Orange. Now this is a kinder, gentler 2,4-D. It doesn't have dioxins. Um, or I'm sorry, sorry. It has less dioxins. And it is also supposed to drift less in the wind. But nevertheless, it's one of the most toxic carcinogens ever known to mankind, the legacy of Vietnam among US uh, veterans, let alone among Vietnamese. Multi-generational birth defects and cancers is, is well understood. And now, in their inimitable wisdom, Right at this very moment, on Secretary Vilsack's desk is a petition, which my group stopped. Just Label it was able to put a stop to, but it's a pause, I, I'm sure, until the election, for a 2,4-D resistant corn seed. And that 2,4-D resistant corn seed will unlock a whole generation of 2,4-D resistant seeds. So understand the simple paradigm here. Follow the money. Chemical companies own the seeds. They, they're patented, by the way. They're unique, they are patented, right? But then they go over to the FDA and say, there's, no, there's nothing different, they shouldn't be labeled. But over at Commerce, they're different, right? It's just this total hypocrisy. But more to the point, they, they, they sell these very profitable seeds, they sell these very profitable chemicals, and, and believe me, after the election, you know, we're in for trouble. Now, I was in the White House for two and a half hours on Monday evening. Make, this is, we're, we're working, this co coalition, uh, the Just Label It group, which I hope the, the third thing that you'll do tonight after the omega-3s and the organic is you'll go and take you 20 seconds at justlabelit.org. Join our petition. 1.3 million people have joined. And the reason that they've joined is not only because we believe that it is material, that we do have the right to know what's going on with our food, that even though the seeds and the crops are, we're still trying to, you know, science will take a while to figure out you know, whether they're actually dangerous or not. There was a study released in France a month ago that showed tumor growth from rats eating um, uh, GMO corn. By the way, this is the first independent study that's been peer reviewed and published. All the studies on GMOs have been done by the companies who own the patents. And you're not allowed to research these seeds without violating their patent. This French scientist smuggled GMO corn seeds out of Canada and did a two year study. All the safety studies done by Monsanto um, are done for 90 days, and 99% and of rats in the study develop tumors, but th that aside, it is only one study. But we believe it's material. But more to the point, the, the bill of goods that was sold to America on, and, and to the world and to these large grocery, uh, these large food companies, is that we need these foods to feed the world. Well, the Union of Concerned Scientists came out with this report looking at 20 years of research, 13 years of actual commercialization, and found zero incidences of increased yield. You know, you will hear Bill Gates, and you will hear, you know, uh, uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle saying, no, 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 we need this. This is 9.6 billion, a million people, a billion people are coming. We're going to need this to feed the world. There is no evidence of increased yields yet. The only two yields that we've seen go up are, yield, are increased use of chemicals and increased profits for these companies, okay? And, and, and so, so this is a problem. So that's why our coalition, um, oh, this is the, this is the uh, if you speak French, uh, yes, the GMOs are, are, are poisons. This was on uh, 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 the, the, the week that the report came out on the rats in France. This is the front page of the, 
uh, L'Observateur. Uh, this is a book, if you're interested by now, you probably you know, don't ever want to hear from me ever again. <laughs> but if you do want to know more about the science, you can download this ebook, uh, and you can get a lot more information on this stuff. But more importantly, uh, please go to our website. 1.3 million people have joined us. By the way, this is not, you know, hippie liberals from Wilton, New Hampshire, you know, yogurt making, you know, guys who weren't exhaling in the 60s, okay? This is, I mean, we have, we have the religious, we have religious organizations with us. Who, their nickname for GMO is God Move Over. They don't like messing with God's work. And, and we have, of course, environmental groups. And we have the American Nurses Association because they see the health effects that, that have brought you here tonight. So just label it as a, really powerful, interesting group. It's a place you can go and tell the FDA that matters. We're hoping to have two million petitions by election day. Yeah? What about agricultural schools? How about we, we have the interesting new allies that I have in this fight are a whole group of conventional land-grant weed scientists out of Penn State and Iowa State who are seeing this chemical inflation happening. That's the farmers who are, that's the, 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 the scientists who were talking to us at Davis last week. Now, what do we do with all this? Well, uh, one of the heroes and Megs in my life is a, a wonderful, unfortunately departed friend named David Servan Schreiber, who wrote a brilliant book called Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life. If you have not read this, this is the fourth thing you must do. Um, D David David, um, who became a very dear friend of ours, uh, contracted an extremely aggressive form of brain cancer nine, uh, now 21 years ago, but ni 19, he lived for 19 years with this cancer that, that in 99% of the cases you, kills you within six months of your diagnosis. And over those 18 and a half years that he lived, he, he's, he's a, a research MD, uh, a neurologist, and a uh, psychiatrist. And he, da David decided to dive in, as Lorenzo Cohen has now picked up at MD Anderson, the baton, and look at what are the, what's the systemic, what's going on here? What are the systemic conditions? What are the components of this lifestyle, these lifestyle choices? And his key point is that we all carry cancer cells in our body, but not all of us are going to have cancer. And what's going on there? What are the conditions that we create? Well, I've already mentioned a couple. And David went in and did a pretty thorough analysis and essentially uh, concluded four things that, again, not only have we been consuming uh, chemicals since the mid-40s, which is really when we started to see the cancer trend on the uptick, but of course we've been consuming massive amounts more sugar, notably in, in diets and sodas, um, uh, uh, since uh, the mid-1940s. Uh, we've become a lot more sedentary. Uh, we're sitting in front of screens, and of course, you know, now our kids are carrying the screens around with us, and we're just not as physically active, and that's, of course, part and parcel of the obesity crisis. This is an actual ad from Life magazine when I was in sixth grade. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we have, of course, allowed ourselves this exposure to these compounds. And finally, I mentioned the fourth component. And what David and Lorenzo have, uh, what David has shown clinically looking at actual human populations on both the preventative end and also the treatment end, is that when you reduce sugars substantially or when you become more active physically or when you avoid toxins or when you reduce omega-3s and when you are taking care of your mental health, when you, are, when you have a positive attitude, he, he looked, for example, at correlation studies, and Lorenzo does this devastating data about people who live alone uh, uh, and unemployed are, have a higher proclivity for cancer than people who are socially active. When you look at all of these, what he showed, no surprise, I'm sure, to any of you, is that each time you engage in one of these, you can drop, if, you're, if, the, if, the, if the cancer rates are 41% of us, each time you aggressively alter your lifestyle to adapt, uh, make changes in one of these areas, you can reduce by one. And if you go to two, you can go to another layer, another layer, and another layer. And when you go to all five, you get to this place that's well, well, well below. We're talking in the single digit range of likelihood of, um, of cancer occurrence or recurrence. In other words, it's a lifestyle issue. It's a preventative issue. And, you know, I made the joke about starting an organic yogurt company in 1983, but 
you know, my background is actually climate change. It wasn't toxins. It wasn't uh, even agriculture. But I understood back then that we really needed to change the way we were thinking. I was looking at the disappearance of family farmers, uh, the disappearance of fresh food. I was looking at the, uh, the fact that from Mount Washington, where I did my tree line research, uh, uh, one could see the Atlantic Ocean when I was a kid. You can't see that, the Atlantic Ocean, anymore because we're downwind from all the pollutants. And I, I recognize that we really need to change not just how we behave, our lifestyles, but actually how we think. And I, I got this wonderful graphic from the World Wildlife Federation that really helps to s explain it. If I asked you how much water was in this cup of latte you might have had this morning, you'd say, well, was it a tall or a grande or, you know. And, and, and that, that, that sort of, that might, you know, so 12 ounces, 10 ounces, 14 ounces. And you'd be partly right. Uh, in fact, to make a cup of coffee takes 208 quarts of water, we would call it. But th there's the water needed to grow the coffee, the water needed to grow the milk, the, the, the grain to feed the cows, the water needed to clean the dairy, the water needed to feed the cows, the water needed to grow the sugar, all these industrial processes. In other words, there's a giant water footprint behind everything we do that's much, much larger than what you think you're consuming. The bottled water, uh, there's, a, there's a much bigger water footprint than just what you're consuming. We have a big toxic footprint, we have a big carbon footprint, we have a big footprint as a species. And only when we start to understand that we are part of nature, that these are ecosystems we're carrying around that need to be treated systemically, that we can't just be uh, blind and, and think that, you know, uh, we can uh, uh, withstand all of these, uh, you know, footprints, all of these extra lifestyle choices we're making. Only when we can do that do I believe we will have the basis of a preventative health care system. And so in environmental terms, and again, I ask you to make the leap from thinking of environmental to the outside to thinking about environmental to your body, because that's really what we're talking about, treating this ecosystem. And if you look from a business point of view at environmental compliance, you know, you would say, well, you know, first you want to get your facility in compliance. You want to, you know, be, don't be fined, don't be sued, right? You know, then you want to, you know, maybe reduce your waste and stop the outflow of money. And then maybe you want to improve your supply chain, try to look at, you know, the things you're purchasing and use, you know, buy stuff that has less chemicals. And ultimately, you know, you want to get to this, 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 what I call the fourth stage, the place where we all need to live, where we are part of nature. So the example I like to give is that, you know, I'm very proud of all of our recycling efforts and we're, I think, probably the most advanced recycler of any yogurt company in the world. But that's not success, because when you recycle, you're shredding and melting, you're using energy to, and there's a carbon footprint to recycling. Uh, success will be when you finish eating the yogurt, you'll eat the cup. Uh, and that's the way nature is, right? There's no waste from one system. It's, waste from one is always the food for another. And by the way, you're laughing at this, but I actually ate packaging uh, last month in France. That's when I came back and picked up that magazine. And I'm, I'm, there's actually a company that I'm working with now that may come soon. So this leads me to my unabashed self-promotional plug here that what is organic? You know, a lot of people think, okay, it's, what it is is more expensive. And they're right. And there's a reason for that. And I could talk to you about that. But what organic is, is it's fourth stage living. Organic is making ourselves part of our natural systems. Organic is treating the, er, the world as if uh, nature really mattered. It's treating our bodies as if we were natural. It's not any more complex than that. And I will tell you, to, back to the point about profitability, um, you know, organic has continued to outpace non-organic, even through the recession. This is dairy. Here's total food. Even through the recession, though it dipped, organic still grew faster, five, six times faster than conventional food. It's, it's the good news about the organic industry is that and I couldn't even use the word organic and industry in the same sentence through most of my career. You know, I always describe Stonyfield as a 28-year overnight success. You know, you have to understand in the early days, I, I, I'm the first to admit organic used to mean you have to chew extra. And I think some of you probably know what I mean. Those, you know, the early natural food stores with the extra thick bread and the, you know, the broccoli that was, you know, sort of excessively crunchy and, and plus the moths that you would get. You know, we were not, the early organic folks were not really thinking about food, but we sort of have figured it out. It's, it's food, it's gourmet. And now whether you're in the organic beer business or wine or dairy business, it's now consonant. The finest chefs on, you know, in America are proudly talk, you know, about their organic uh, uh, offerings. So um, the happy news here is that organic is win, 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 win economics. 
My farmers, this chart here, this line is what we pay our farmers for their milk. This is what they get paid if they're not organic. It's a roller coaster ride. And, you know, Nancy, you have farmers in your district. I mean, every, all across New Hampshire, we're down to 83 family farms in New Hampshire because of this roller coaster. We can't, farmers can't make it when they're uh, getting not, when they're getting paid at this rate. We, we pay them a proper price. That is to say, you help me to pay it because you, in supporting us. So it's economically proven. We have 1,600 family farmers. Average herd size is 90 cows. They're all profitable. All of them were not profitable when they were conventional. That's why they switched. Well, I won't read you all these bullets. This is what, ha just from my milk impacts alone, this is the impacts of, of our chemical-free agriculture. We, 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 our total ingredients is in the millions of acres of chemical-free agriculture, and everybody is winning along the way. And I want to give you two examples of this. And forgive me for going deep into organics, but this is, uh, this is relevant to the cleaning detergents that you use. This is relevant to the toothpaste you're using. This is relevant to the clothing we're wearing. These, this is at the heart of the lifestyle choices that we need to make as a society. This is eminently preventable. We've just gotten ourselves, you know, down this, I call it cul-de-sac, it's not a dead end, but into this place where we sort of were ignoring, you know, nature. What you're looking at here is 60, 55,000 acres of organic sugar cane in Brazil where we grow our sugar. And the farmers who uh, were uh, my partners here in the mid-90s, um, they, the traditional way of growing sugarcane is that you burn the fields right before harvest because there's a lot of photosynthesis, there's a lot of, a lot of leafy matter, which again, as humans, we think of as waste because it's done doing its thing. And um, so you go in and you burn it, which of course sends a huge amount of carbon into the atmosphere. And then any nutritional, any nutrients that were built up in the topsoil during that season are also volatized. So you actually have to replace that, those nutrients with chemicals, with chemical fertilizer. And our farmers saw this and said, gee, this is just inflationary. Every year we're burning, we're sending it up, and then we buy, you know, natural gas from Venezuela or fertilizers from Kuwait, and, uh, you know, off we go. And so they converted over, and today, using all these practices, and I won't, you know, give you a big ag lecture at this hour, but the point is using completely biological and ecological approaches, uh, what they've done is they have found a way to highly profitably produce higher yields than they were doing when they weren't uh, organic. Here's the, what's going on. They're shredding, this is the sugar cane going into the truck. They're shredding the leafy matter. This is me grabbing a, a clump of it. It's a meter deep. Uh, the, the, these, these soils are never exposed to the erosive effects of wind or water for one second. An enormous amount of biodiversity has resulted because they're building healthy topsoils. Um, and this gives you some of the ideas. They've had a 90% reduction in pest damage switching over to organic. They, 312 species have returned to these fields. I, I don't know where you want to buy your food, but I prefer to buy where the bugs are flying and the animals are, are, are hanging out. I, I've been on Central Valley dairy farms in California where um, uh, organic dairy farms where you get out of the truck and the bees and the birds and the butterflies are zooming all over the place. And this farmer popped me into his truck, drove me to his cousin's farm a quarter mile away, his non-organic farmer uh, with, with GMO corn. And you got out of the truck and there's nothing flying around. You know, the insects don't, like I said, wait to do focus groups. They, they're not going to hang out where the poisons are. It's just us who are stupid enough to do that. Um, <laughs> Groundwater quality and volume has improved. The topsoils are rich. Now they're almost equal to native forest. But again, they've had, actually I have to update this, the, the latest data uh, from last, our winter, their summer, 15% uh, increased yields over when they were non-organic. And organic sugar used to cost me 100% more and it's now at the same exact price as conventional because of the volumes. So I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples, and at this hour I'm certainly not going to subject you to them. Um, this is, uh, I'm sure all of you read dairy magazines at night, and this is, an, <laughs> this is an ad from the one I was reading recently. This is an ad from Pfizer. And, and it says, you know, what if reduction of 0157870 E. coli, which, you know, will kill people, it's, it's a new organism that we've actually created in this unnatural thing called a feedlot. What if they could start what if reduction could start at the source? This is, of course, by, you know, use Pfizer drugs, right? So I did a little bit of messing around with, um, and I thought, this is really what the ad should say. Switch to organic, and it will be. My farmer, organic dairy cows 
most people don't know this, live two to three times longer. Not two to three percent, two to three times, 200 to 300 percent longer than non-organic dairy farmers. Where do you want to get your milk, right? Uh, they, and the vets describe themselves as the Maytag uh, repairmen. They just don't visit the organic farms. They, organic cows don't get sick. Um, and, and this is not, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. This is USDA data. I showed you a study a while ago, back in the depressing part of this uh, evening, um, where kids on conventional diets, this is Washington, University of Washington, um, this was published in Environmental Health Perspectives. A group of uh, uh, school-age kids were put on conventional diets, or kept on conventional diets, and the, every day, every time they peed, the organophosphates, the, 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 the uh, pesticides in their urine was sampled, and this is, gives you a rough idea. They were then switched over to organic diets, the same kids, for a week, and you see what happened, and then they were switched back to conventional diets. The, the good news in this slide is that our bodies can process this stuff pretty quickly. We switch over, it's like, we can it's like lung, rebuilding lung tissue after smoking. You actually can, it's been shown, you can actually heal yourself. Our bodies uh, want you know, to head towards healing, but, but we've got to give them a chance. We have to, uh, there is hope here, and of course the converse is also true. Um, I know some of you saw this, you know, dis this just absolutely extraordinarily um, pathetic study released by uh, Stanford University this summer, funded by Car uh, Car Cargill funding, we now know, that said that organic is not more nutritious than conventional. Um, this is what the word that has come out uh, of this is called a manufactroversy. Uh, we had never in the organic world ever said it was more nutritious. Um, it's not about more vitamins, and by the way, they only looked at vitamins, and by the way, this study, John Reganold, I was just with him last week, Washington State, which shows higher antioxidants um, in star organic strawberries than conventional. This study was missed, as were about 30 other studies that, that were, this was a compilation. This thing is a joke, but it was brilliant. By the way, the same PR firm working for these guys have worked for tobacco and for big coal, and you know how this game works. Again, follow the money. But I, again, the reason to go organic might be nutritional. We'll know that over time. We get higher antioxidants. We get, by the way, the study did talk about lower omega, I mean, uh, much higher omega-3s. But the reality is that um, the reason, the main reason you need organic is to avoid toxins, is to avoid pesticides. Uh, what I can tell you is when they, when they tell me, at, you know, when I debate, I was on Dr. Oz yesterday and they put a, a woman up there who's a scientist who says, you know, well, you can't get the yields from organic, you can get from conventional. I, you know, I can tell you, Iowa State University, long-term studies showing higher, show, showing yields over time, similar yields but much higher economic return. I can show, of or, organic versus conventional. I can show you Rodale studies over 30 years that show higher yields. I can show you that the UN, uh, uh, in a number of different reports just recently, has said there's no way we're feeding sub-Saharan Africa without uh, organic and sustainable methods. That, that uh, GMO, these farmers cannot afford GMO seed. They can't afford the chemicals that go with them. Uh, so uh, again, what I can tell you is that in a, in a debate, in a discussion, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, ourselves uh, plenty of data if we're willing to be scientific in our orientation. And this is, of course, one of the great questions. When you're not allowed to look at organic seed, I'm sorry, when you're not, not allowed to look at GM, GMO seed, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do what I'm trying to do here. I wanted to show you a quick film. There we go. Bear with me here. This is a, this is a. It's at the bottom. At the bottom. Oh, it's at the bottom, thank yeah, you. I don't, I, I don't have my glasses, so I'm really suffering over here. Uh, someone maybe wanna walk up, this one right there? Over here? Yeah, thank you, I can't. Uh, Whatever. Oh yeah, there it is. Thank you. To the left. Yeah. Who's who's messing with me? All right. Let's see if we can uh, see this film. It'll just take a. Okay. Well then, let's forget it. So uh, while my technical assistant here is uh, supporting me, um, no. All, all I wanted to say to you is that uh, you know this. The opening comment that you don't make money on prevention is utterly true with in agriculture as well. The money is in the chemicals, for sure. The money's in the technology. 
And uh, you know, in a post-Citizens United world where we are no longer having you know, elections, we're having sales, right? I mean, this is where really, I mean, you know, you know the money that's being spent in New Hampshire. I don't know that you can go through all that. Let's just go back to the slides, it's okay. Yeah, I, I think, well, it'll take too long, it's okay. Well, we, we, I'll tell you what, during the Q&A, we'll try to do it and, and then, because I want to get to talk to you, but I, uh, we can just go back to this slide right here. If you, oh, sorry, <laughs> you're not looking at <laughs> this, this slide right there. <laughs> um, it's a distortion. Uh, thank you, and then if you just get me back to my slideshow. Yeah, there's a thing down here you can, if I can just get my glasses, I can do all this. We are, we are, we are uh, a team. Uh, no, no, here. Sorry, everybody. Let me let me do it. Let me do it. See, here's here's my trick. I go over here and look at the big screen and do that. Okay. All right. Anyhow, um, thank you for trying. Um, look, let me. This is. I'm nearly done here. Let me let me just say this. Um, the 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 challenge that we've got is that um, we have the data, but what we need is we need regulators, we need a president, we need senators and congresspeople who want to be science-based in our thinking and objective. Right now, we are not allowed to test and look at GMO seeds. Science is being suppressed. The only folks looking at it are the patent holders. Um, when you look at lobbyists, the biotech lobby has spent $586 million in these 16 years on lobbying alone, and God knows how much on campaign donations, okay? I'm sure multiples of that. Uh, to stop our country from having a civilized debate like we're trying to have here tonight. The tragedy of this, of course, is that I've already shared with you the dollars. Preventative health care is utterly and absolutely the best ROI that you could possibly get. This comes home in so many ways, but let me show you one in closing here, one particularly egregious way. So this is what the FDA tells us now we're supposed to be eating. You know, 11 servings of grains, nine servings of fruits and vegetables, not as much protein, frankly, yogurt or any other, not as much meat as we used to think, and a hell of a lot less sugar and oils than we used to think. This is what we're subsidizing, okay? <laughs> it, 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 and let me just help you along here. This is the exact reciprocal of what we're being told, you know, if you think, you know, our kids are confused, you know, what are they being taught in school? This. What is on their shelves in their cafeterias? This. I mean, this is what's going on. Look, look at the arrows. You know, we're not supposed to eat so much meat. And, that's corn. That's the corn lobby right there. That, and soy. That's where it's going. Now, you all know, I mean, they're, the farm bill, look at sugars. <laughs> not supposed to eat much of it. And look at vegetables and fruits. It's a rounding error <laughs> over there. Um, I mean, this is, this is what's going on. This is the picture. And you could make this, you could talk about health care in the same context. So um, I don't know about you, but you know, Lily Tomlin, my favorite philosopher, has this great line. She says, uh, no matter how cynical I get, it's hard to keep up. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I actually, in fact, look at this and I'm hopeful. And this is why I'm hopeful. Because first of all, you know why this is going on. There's a lag, right, in government. It's, it's the, those, the folks who made money in the past, which is in the unconscious past of the 20th century, are the status quo, right? The Kellogg's and the Cargill's and the Monsanto's. And yet look around us at the, the, the passion for local and natural and transparent. And, you know, is it, I mean, we're having debates about is it organic enough? That's the kind of debate I love having. Um, at, the average citizen gets what we're talking about tonight. You know, people don't want to get sick. Now, the problem with this whole thing is with the subsidies, that's, this now becomes cheap. And there's a thousand reasons to eat organic food. There's one reason not to, and it's a good reason for most people on limited means. It's more expensive. But if you take away the subsidies, you level the playing field dramatically. And frankly, and candidly, in my 30 years in business, what I've learned is that it tastes better. This is the main reason people come to organic is not even about the pesticides. They, it's, it's, it's real food. And the number one way I know to reduce the premium, the higher cost of organic, Maxine and I were talking, we're in Costco now, we're in um, Sam's Club, we're in Walmart. 
Um, this is all helpful, and this is, we're also, believe me, supporting our co-ops and our CSAs and everybody else, but basically what we, we affluentials, educated folks who can take an evening like this to get ourselves educated, we're the ones who have to leverage the change. And what I've learned is our little $4 billion, our, our, our little 4.2%, $31 billion segment, which is growing faster than the conventional side, is being driven by a very small number of people. But yet we're growing six times faster. We're growing more jobs in organic than in conventional. It's contributing to our balance of trade. Our exports uh, are of, of, of uh, GMO crops are down because, by the way, 50 other nations around the world require labeling of genetically engineered food. Really progressive countries like Russia and China require labeling of genetically engineered foods. And we don't do it here. So the bottom line is that we, and here, you know, this is the, Organics is 4% is of 4.4% of U.S. food, but we're 1.5% of, you know, U.S. ag budget. So, the bottom line in all of this is that we need to be active. We need to be politically active. We need to vote as this this, this stuff matters. And I don't just mean vote in these all important elections. And certainly, this one is you know all important from where I sit. But it's also about voting every time you shop. You know, even if you can't fill your shopping basket with organic, you buy one thing, if, 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 all Ameri if, if, if the wealthy segment of America, and I, we're all in it here, uh, if we uh, uh, would purchase one item of organic, you add a billion dollars to the sales. So let me close by just quickly mentioning and tying all this together. My wife um, has uh, founded a, f a program over at Concord Hospital that I really want you to know about. It's, it's taking David Servan Schreiber's work and um, Lorenzo Cohen's work. And it's, it's something called the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. And what it is, is it's taking folks who are cancer survivors, and it's helping them through 12 weekly sessions uh, to get the information that they need to have power. Meg, when she uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer, she went through you know, the surgery, the chemo, the radiation. At the end, she said to her doctor, okay, what can I do now? And you know, the doc said, well, you should get some exercise. And she, you know, she's, she's the, 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 the patient, she said, well, what kind of exercise? How much exercise? When? You know, what should I be doing? Now you said, don't, don't worry about it. Just get some exercise. Go back to your normal life. This was, and I'm sure cancer folks all around know what I'm talking, cancer uh, patients know, know this. This is the norm. So what they did is they looked at all of these areas, the diet, fitness, uh, the mindset, the mental health, meditation, yoga, wellness thinking and of course toxin-free living. And we've pulled together faculty in our community, in Concord, who come and give classes. And these are folks who, believe me, have never looked under their kitchen sink like they're looking at them now. And you ought to look tonight and see what's there. And, and uh, because, uh, unfortunately, you know, we are the unconscious, you know, we're not thinking about that stuff, right? We're just trying to get through our lives. And they have had, and, and, and this is now, we've gone through two rounds, it clinically, uh, it, it, we have ha already seen a reduction of risk and recurrence in this population. Of, and, 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 and we're in now our third semester. So in 2011, we piloted the first group with 17 participants. This year, we're now with uh, two, uh, we have two groups going. We're doing internal replication side by side, multiplying our scale. The folks from Livestrong are coming up to visit us next Monday to talk to us about rolling this thing out nationally in other hospitals. We're, going to, we're working right now on uh, two to three sites for next year and creating more anti-cancer anti lifestyle groups. But you can go to the website yourselves and learn. Go to anticancerlifestyle.org and you'll see that this is not, you know, you don't have to like get educated. You don't have to become an organic expert. You don't have to change every single thing in your lifestyle. You can make, but the small changes are what add up. And this is what I talk about voting and acting and being political. We, the people, have to take this system back. Uh, the opening remarks were absolutely dead on. Um, we are, we are fight, the, 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 the large chemical interests who are protecting their status quo, protecting their profits, are not going to be preaching this stuff. This is doable at our scale. We don't need a lot of money. Uh, we just need to be educated, and we need to educate our fellow citizens about making these choices. You know, I would add another box here you know, which is be politically active, you know, support candidates who say they're going to support your right to know what's in your food. Again, join us at justlabelit.org. 
So I, I, I leave you here and, and uh, see what questions you have. But I, 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 I just, uh, my poor mother has heard me make this joke 8,000 times, so I apologize, Mom, right now. But it is, it is, this, is, this sort of says it all. Uh, you know, Gandhi said, had this great line. He said, anyone who thinks that, anyone who thinks that uh, they can't make a difference has never been in bed with a mosquito. And, and you know what that's like. You know, you're lying in bed, and this little thing is, you know, keeping you awake. We can be mosquitoes. You know, this program that you've put together and this work is about taking back our power. My Just Label campaign is about demanding that our government be of, for, and by the people, not of, for, and by six chemical companies. And we can do that. That's a, Washington ultimately, no matter what money is being spent, Ultimately, it's the votes that count, and we have to make them count. So thank you for listening. Thanks.